Hello, my name is Rachel Barrett and I would like to present to you all our work done at the University College London Hospitals on urinary continence outcomes after urethral diverticulectomy. I have nothing to disclose. As we know, urethral diverticulum is a rare condition. It is known to be associated with urinary incontinence, but the true instance of this and the best way to manage it is not known due to its rarity and therefore the paucity of evidence in the literature. We report our large series of patients undergoing urethral diverticulum excision with a focus on continence outcomes with this in mind. Our retrospective analysis identified 122 consecutive patients over a 13 year period undergoing urethral diverticulum excision with Marsh's fat pad interposition. All patients have a minimum follow up of 12 months. The data we collected is outlined on the slide. All our patients underwent preoperative investigations with video urodynamics and MRI imaging, except for the first seven patients of the series. And any patient with postoperative incontinence complaints would be offered repeat video urodynamics. Our cohort had a mean age of 45.2 years, with a range of 19 to 73 years. Of the 122 patients, we excluded four patients from the analysis due to findings of malignancy at the time of surgery, which changed their post-operative course. These 118 patients were then available for post-operative analysis. For pre-operative analysis, seven patients were further excluded, as previously mentioned, due to being the first in the series and not having urodynamic data available. It's worth noting that symptomatically, three reported symptoms of stress incontinence and one reported verge incontinence. This table highlights the incidence of incontinence in our cohort. This shows both the pre-op and post-operative settings, and in the post-operative settings, splits it down further to new onset or de novo incontinence, and those patients who had persistent pre-existing incontinence. As you can see quite clearly, stress urine incontinence predominates in both the pre-op and post-operative settings. It is worth noting, however, that a third of patients with preoperative stress urine incontinence will have resolution of this with simple excision of the diverticulum alone. Both choose incontinence and mixed urine incontinence occur in very small numbers to really make any significant conclusions other than to say that the choose incontinence seems to persist into the postoperative setting in all cases in our cohort. We also looked at bladder outflow obstruction, which was present in two thirds of our cohort prior to surgery, and reassuringly disappears in almost all cases. And those two patients reported were patients who had pre-existing urethral strictures. It is perhaps further interesting that our rates of detrusive active incontinence are not higher due to this high preoperative finding of obstruction. Looking at the treatment of the 51 patients who had postoperative urine incontinence, if we split these up into cause, so for the stress urine incontinence patients, all of them were offered and went through pelvic floor muscle therapy training, and of these, 50% achieved continence just with these conservative measures. Of the remaining 22 patients, three are either still awaiting surgery or were offered surgery and have declined. And of the 19 that underwent surgical intervention, 79% are dry. Surgical interventions offered are bulking agents, autologous rectus fascial sling, corpus suspension, and blood link artificial urine sphincter. And in the years before the mesh ban in the UK, a synthetic midurethral tape would also have been offered. It's worth noting that no patients have had a corpus suspension or a blood neck artificial urine sphincter in this series. For the patients with detrusive reactivity incontinence, again, all started with conservative measures, including bladder retraining, pelvic floor muscle therapy and medication, and 50% achieved continence with this alone. The remaining two patients were offered all options for detrusive reactivity incontinence, including intravesical Botox injections, sacral neuromodulation and peripheral to the nerve stimulation, both opted for Botox treatments and are dry. Finally, in the mixed urine incontinence group, two patients underwent staged interventions for both the stress and urge component of their symptoms, 
with success in one patient and ongoing urge incontinence in the other. And one patient had urge predominant symptoms, which set up with sacral neuromodulation alongside the conservative measures for the stress component. This is a large cohort in the literature, and it gives us an idea of the possible true instance of incontinence in these patients. But it's worth acknowledging that the majority of our cohort have complex diverticula, and therefore the post-operative incontinence rate should be interpreted in light of this. We feel it's important to highlight that a third of patients have resolution of their incontinence simply by excising the diverticulum alone. And of those that are symptomatic postoperatively, 50% improve with conservative measures alone. And this all supports um, a more conservative strategy of treating the diverticulum first and then treating subsequent incontinence later. We use a Marsh's fat pad as we feel this makes this a, a healthier plane to be coming back to for a second procedure. And helps, of course, with the postoperative healing and reducing the risk of a buccal vaginal fistula. This study also shows that the surgical management of ongoing incontinence after a diverticulectomy is effective and the success rates mirror those uh, for primary incontinence procedures. To summarise, we find that urinary incontinence is found at 31.4% of patients at presentation with a diverticulum and 43.2% after diverticulectomy. Pre-operative stress urine incontinence will resolve in 35.3% of cases without any intervention. Conservative treatments for post-operative urinary incontinence are successful in 47% of cases, and of those cases refractory to conservative interventions, we can achieve continence in 79.2% of cases with surgical intervention.